So allow me to take uh, some minutes today again to carry on with this session on the heart, guarding the heart. Uh, we are doing session number five. You do well to take time and go back and listen a few of those things we've shared in the previous uh, sessions. But just a quick recap. We did say last week uh, that God is more concerned about the state of your heart than works. And I thought the points that we put across are very critical for us to carry. God is more concerned about the state of your heart than works. All right, so to focus on works, external works alone, and neglect the heart, we establish on the scriptures its hypocrisy and lawlessness, its iniquity. Matthew 7, 6, Jesus said, he answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. All right? So it is when you're giving him a lip service, you're concerned more about the things you're doing and the works you're doing, but your heart is far from him. That's the example we see in Luke chapter 10. Verse 40 to 42, the story of Mary and Martha. Verse 40 to 42 reads, But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Sounds familiar, ladies? Yeah. Sounds familiar? Yeah, yeah I've discovered uh, uh, it is easier to manage more boys than to manage more girls, more ladies. I don't know, I don't know why. And so here is one complaining. Verse 41, and Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried about and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. And the one good part was to sit at the feet of Jesus just to hear the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen? So concentrating on that which will build the heart. So it is your heart, not your service, that Father seeks. But really, what do we emphasize on? Service. Works. Works. The state of your heart, if you could write this down, the state of your heart determines the quality of your service and worship. The state of your heart determines the quality of your service and worship. Therefore, if you want to give God quality service, you want to give God quality worship, the best thing you can do, brothers and sisters, therefore, is to work on your heart. Amen? To ensure the heart is the way it's supposed to be. The priority is your heart. We say that in every dealing and transaction that God has with you, and in every demand that God places on you, what is the goal? Your heart. Okay? His ultimate goal is your heart. What does he want? He wants to build your faith and trust in him. So when God asks you to do this or to do that, when God places a demand on you, he is after your heart. When God asks you for this or that, he is after your heart. God asks for any sacrifice from you, he is after your heart. When God corrects you, when God rebukes you, when God instructs you, he is after your heart. Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. Sometimes when God allows you to go through scarcity, he is after your heart. When God allows you to experience plenty, he is after your heart. Okay? <clears throat> I tell you this today. I tell you this. It takes more character to go through the period of plenty and abundance and remain committed to Christ than it does to go through the period of scarcity and remain committed to Christ. Because in the moment of scarcity, you actually seek him more. Talk to me, somebody. You seek him more. You, you call on his name more. You, you, you pray more. You, are? you need him more. I need you, Lord. Mm -hmm. I know it is something so I love you, Lord. This time you change it. I need you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. I need you, Lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
But when you have plenty, abundance, it's not easy. So God can expose you or allow you to go through either of those extremes. But remember this. The focus, the goal is your heart. Can I hear an amen? amen. It's your heart. God blesses you, my friend. He doesn't bless you for you to show off your pride. He blesses you, but the focus is your heart. He's after your heart. He's after your heart. All right? He's after your heart. So listen. Whichever extreme God may allow you to go through, the end goal is the same. The heart. When one is completely broke and the other one doesn't know what to do with the money they have, both of them, the goal is the heart. The heart. And so please never neglect your heart. All right? Do not neglect your heart. And he, 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 he took the children of Israel through the same process. That, that he could bring them to a place where they can trust him. Have faith in him and trust him. That's all that God wants. God wants you to come to a place where whether you have scarcity or plenty, you have faith in him and your trust in him, your confidence in him is unquestionable, is unchangeable. Can I hear an amen? amen. Yeah. That's what God is after, your trust. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 5. Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 5. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. So there's a promise that has been given to fathers, all right? But for you to access the fullness of the promise and to multiply, you've got to hear and obey the word. Are we together? That's the nexus between obedience and productivity. Verse 2 says, <clears throat> And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you. Read the next one. To, to know. know what was in your heart. Whether you would keep his commandments or not. All right? To know here does not talk of he did not know. He knew. But he wanted you to see what is in your heart. He's testing and trying you to bring to the open to you what is in your heart. They say, you don't know a man until you have given him power. Whether it is financial power, political power, position of power, or any kind of power. Then you get to know the man. Talk to me. Have you ever left your children together in the house and you made one of them in charge of the other. Talk to me. And they suddenly become the mini you. By the way, if you want to know who you are, put on some CCTV in your house, then just make one of them your boss, the boss over the others, and leave. They will behave exactly like you behave. They will begin to mimic you. They will begin to express you. They will exercise authority as you do. Right? Power. Pressure also brings out a man. Pressure. Put a man under pressure. He will know who he is. I normally say this every man is polite and patient and humble until they come under. Pressure. Then you will know who you are dealing with. Talk to me, somebody. Yeah. When they're under pressure, everything changes. They become irritable, they become, you know, you know what they become. They, you know what? They become when they are under what? Pressure. And you know, by the way, when you are under pressure, you are not normal. Yeah. That's why you should listen more when you are under pressure. But that's when you don't listen. Are we together? If you're not normal, then you are abnormal. 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 And that's why you should listen. Because you cannot make a sober, solid decision. You are abnormal. Talk to me, somebody. Yes. What do you do with an abnormal person? You help them. Are we together? Yes. What counsel would you give to an abnormal person? Agree to be 
helped. Talk to me, somebody. So when you're under pressure, come down and listen. But when we are under pressure, we don't listen. That's when we know. We know what to do. Talk to me, somebody. We know what to do. And all the wives say, all the husbands say, all the children say, pressure. Did you know when you're under pressure, no one knows except you? When you're under pressure, no one knows except you. Because the idea you have is they don't understand me, they don't know what I'm going through. So you know what to do. We're together. My friend, pressure. That's what God did. He subjected these people to pressure. To humble and test them to know what was in their hearts. Verse 3 says, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger. Talk to me. He allowed you. Yeah, God can allow you to go through hunger. God can. And guess what? He was doing it as God. Mm -hmm. He allowed you to go through to hunger. And fed you with manna which you did not know. Nor did your fathers know. That he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone. But man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. I read that this morning. I was going through it again this morning. And something hit me. Look at verse 3 again. That, and fed you with manna. Can you see that one? Yeah. And fed you with manna, which you did not know. Uh -huh. no. Nor did your fathers. No. So God can do something in me and for me that he has not done for my fathers in the past. I'm not limited to what happened to my fathers. Oh, praise God. He can introduce me to horizons that my fathers never saw or never got to. Because he's God. They had not seen manna, but he gave them manna. Don't be limited to your fathers and grandfather. Talk to me. Yeah. No. God can do to me what he never did. And listen to me. I say this. God can do to my children what he never did for me. And he can make them see. Indeed, may he make them to see and access what I never saw or accessed. Oh, yes. Hmm? Then he says something interesting. Look at the contrast. Here, they are hungering. They have no food. But look at verse 4. Your garments did not wear out on you. Now, that's a miracle. That's how God clothed them. By simply ensuring the garments do not wear out. Nor did your foot swell these 40 yes. divine preservation right there. Right? So there is no bread, but then it rains manna from heaven, and then your clothes are not wearing out, your feet are not swelling and you're walking. What is God after? He wants to teach you to trust him. He's after your heart. Hallelujah. We are saying that it is your heart that God is after, not your treasure. Again, dealing with money issues and property. When God comes to you and lays a demand, places a demand on your property, places a demand on your money, when he's asking, telling Moses, tell them to bring me an offering. He's not after your treasure. He's not after your money. He's after your heart. The state of your heart determines your giving. Talk to me. The state of your heart determines the quality of your giving, my friends. Man cannot give beyond what has been worked on in his heart by God. Look at this. He says in verse 21 of uh, Matthew 6, 19 to 21. 19 to 21. Verse 21 he says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The first time I read this verse, I, I, felt, I, I thought that uh, Jesus said the right thing, but the writers wrote the wrong thing. That was my thought. I, because I knew Jesus can't make a mistake. But the statement is not accurate according to me. So it must be that Jesus said the right thing, then the writers wrote the wrong thing. 
I thought it should be for where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Oh, what do you think? I thought so. I thought so. I thought that because I love her, that's where my heart is, then I will invest. I thought that treasure follows the heart. But Jesus knows that is humanly speaking. He knows your heart follows your treasure. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen? So God is after the loyalty of your heart. It's important for you and I to be concerned about the state of your heart. <clears throat> now, God desires a heart that is loyal to him. A heart that genuinely loves him, fully trusts him, and obeys him unconditionally. God is seeking for a heart that is loyal to him. Loyal to him. That's why we have to guard our hearts consciously. Remember Jesus telling us, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. All right? Look at what it says in uh, Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let me say something interesting. And the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, sorry, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will do what? will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. So very interesting. Very interesting. So you pray. I, I don't know how to say this. We need to read the scriptures the way they are. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known. What is the first answer to prayer? Peace. The first answer to prayer is what? Peace. peace. It's not that you pray, the peace of God will guard, will garrison, will protect, will guard your heart. And the peace of God will guard and peripatia, will, will garrison, will, will make sure that you are secure. The peace of God will guard your heart. Hallelujah. Amen. So you can therefore see that the answer to prayer again is connected to your heart. Why does God answer your prayer? It has to do with your heart. When answer is delayed, when answer is fast, the again agenda is what? Your heart. Your heart. Let's bring these things into perspective. It's your heart. God desires cleanliness and truth in our hearts. A clean heart. He says, behold, it is a truth in the inward part. Psalm 51, verse number 6. You desire truth in the inward, but God desires truth in our hearts. He says in verse 10 of the same uh, Psalm 51, verse 10, create in me a clean heart. Begins by saying, verse 6, you desire truth. Then he says, verse 10, create in me a clean heart. Because God desires a heart that is clean and truthful. I submit to us, my brothers and sisters, Truth is very evasive in our day. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Truth. How we need to endeavor to live by truth. A heart that loves the truth, values the truth, speaks the truth, walks in truth. Everyone say truth. truth. Everyone say truth. truth. All right? Now, a few sessions ago, we did say that there are fundamentally two kinds of hearts. A good heart and an evil heart. As we begin looking at that a little bit more today. Now, this is pictured in the Bible through people like Cain and Abel. A good heart and evil heart. Cain and Abel. Ishmael and Isaac. Esau and Jacob. You see them? They are brothers. Cain and Abel. One good, one evil. Ishmael and Isaac. 
right? Esau and Jacob. One who simply desires the flesh and that's all. That's Esau. And the appetite of the flesh. But then there's Jacob who is wrestling with God. So as you consider these two kinds of hearts today, let me just introduce to you as we look at the good heart. It's good to begin with the good heart, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. The good heart. The world is not coming to an end tomorrow. But should it end, and all we have talked is about the evil heart, it's a disaster. Let's begin with the good heart. After all, that's what God is after. Good heart. Amen. Amen. Biblically speaking, and according to kingdom standards, a good heart is a Christ-centered heart. Everyone say Christ-centered. Christ Everyone say Christ-centered. This is a heart that has a living and active relationship with God. A good heart is one that has been transformed by God and is aligned with his character and purposes. Very important to understand. It has been transformed. Everyone say transformed. transformed. Then it is aligned. Everyone say aligned. aligned. Everyone say aligned. So it has been transformed and aligned to God's character and purposes. Yeah, you got it, bro. Yeah. I want to say aligned. aligned. That's how you get a good heart. That's, that's, listen, your work is not to try to have a good heart. You can't. Does that set you free? Yeah. You can't. Please, don't go to Catalonia. To have a good heart. We together. You just in Catalonia, you will get hungry, you'll be bitten by mosquitoes, you will suffer cold, and you come back suffering pneumonia. With the same heart that you carried with you to Catalonia. Well, it's okay. You'll have, at least you'll have lost some weight. That's, that's something. But if you want to have a good heart, your responsibility, your assignment is one, aligning yourself to God's character and purposes. Amen? Everyone say after me, aligning myself to God's character and purposes. These character and purposes are enumerated for us in the word of God. So you have to learn to study the word of God and Consciously align your thinking, align your desires, align your heart to the word of God, align your speech to the word of God. Amen? Align your speech to the word of God. Align your intents, your goals, your passage to God's word. That's the greatest work you can do. And that is the toughest job, aligning yourself. You want to have a good heart, a heart that is Christ-centered, a Christ-like heart, brothers and sisters, don't go for works. Listen, you don't develop a good heart by giving. No. No offering will give you a good heart. No tithe, no fast food will give you a good heart. No. I'm telling you the truth. You can even buy land for us and put up a cathedral and that will not give you a good heart. Talk to me somebody. You can choose to fast for 40 days, like Moses. 40 days, three times a year. It will not give you a good heart. Talk to me. You can choose to see counselors and psychologists, I mean, and that will not give you a good heart. But the moment you determine to begin aligning yourself to the character, and the purposes of God, you are already on the path to having a good heart. Hallelujah. A good heart. This is the heart that pleases God. A heart that honors God. A heart that obeys God. A heart that loves God unconditionally. And how do you get there? Aligning yourself to the word. It's a heart that reflects Christ's love. It's a heart that reflects Christ's humility. 
faithfulness and obedience these things are key in the nature of christ love humility faithfulness and obedience everyone say love, love. everyone say love, love. Humility. humility faithfulness humility. obedience for these things to manifest to become a reality in your life my friends just begin to align as i begin the journey towards a good heart it's a heart that has integrity the integrity of christ Amen. The integrity of the purity of Christ, the compassion of Christ, the love of Christ. In other words, in other words, a good heart is a heart that is nurtured and marinated by the nature of Christ. It's a heart that is marinated by the nature of Christ. It is soaked in and absorbing the nutrients. Hallelujah. So it's a heart that is marinated in the nature of Christ. And how does that take place? By aligning yourself to the word. I want to ask you to align yourself to God's will. It's a heart devoted to God. Open to the rule and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Having a good heart, ladies and gentlemen, is about the totality of the inner being. Your thoughts, your intentions, your desires, all aligned with God's will. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now this word we use called righteousness. If you do a good study of what righteousness is, it has got to do with compatibility to divine design. Aligning yourself to the design of God. Everyone say alignment. alignment. Everyone say alignment. alignment. That is the first step to having a good heart. I want to ask you to carry that with you through the week. Alignment. Amen. And make a deliberate effort to align your thoughts, to align your speech, to align your imaginations, to align your character, to align your conduct, to align your plans to God's character, God's will, God's intent, and God's purposes. The word you hear, make a deliberate effort to align yourself. We'll pick it up from there next week as we look at how a good heart is cultured and governed by the word of God. In the meantime, as you work out of this place today, make a deliberate effort to align your life to God's will. Amen? Amen. Amen. And may the Lord give you grace to align to that which is his purposes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.